And I believe that God wants to do something today that will mark history once again. There have been a lot of meetings in this room. This balcony is actually the balcony that was in the original church. When I was here the other day, what gave birth to this, the new curator, who is a wonderful historian, made a statement. And that statement was that the reason that people came together here on the edge of the frontier in 1801 was because there were not professional preachers who could give communion. You were not allowed just to serve communion if you were not a preacher that was ordained in the ministry and there were so few preachers to go around and down in Car Concord, Kentucky, there had been an awakening of a, a, a lesser influence than the Cane Ridge Meeting House. But they called people together for communion. They sent out letters to the 18 colonies. And when they sent out those letters, it was to bring people together to take communion. Some had not taken communion maybe in a year or two, maybe even longer than that. And communion was very important to them. And so when they came together, they came together for communion. I want to give you a revelation that I know personally that God has given me. I was preaching in the church where Smith Wigglesworth died. Actually, he was at the funeral of his best friend, and his best friend's daughter happened to be a very dear friend of mine. Her name was Sister Parr. And she told me, she said that when Smith Wigglesworth took communion, the apostle of faith, that tears would run down his cheeks like a river. When I was a young minister, I took communion every day because I read the book and it said Smith Wigglesworth took communion every day. And if I thought it was good enough for Smith, it would be good enough for me. And I can't say that anything happened, but I was consistent in my prayer time. I just did not have a revelation. That was years before, some 10 years before I was in the church preaching where he died in the vestry of that church at his best friend's funeral is where he died. And it was a building similar to this, a little bigger, and it was packed and people were hanging over the balcony. Some people here were there. And right in the middle of the service, about 30 minutes into it, we had about 20 people from a team that had been out preaching in another church that came into the building and we had to make room for them to sit down like you'll have to make room for people to sit down I'm standing in the middle of waiting for people to get situated for people to calm down and there was a lot of commotion people saying hi how are you doing I was right in the middle of a message and as I was standing there all of a sudden heaven opened over me and God spoke to me and he said, I'm going to tell you why that Smith Wigglesworth took communion every day. He said he took communion every day because he wanted to live under an open heaven. I'm not suggesting you go out of here and take communion every day. I've not done that. But I can assure you every time I take communion, I know that God's plan is to open heaven when we make things right with him here heaven comes down and that's what happens and I believe that's what happened in 1801 I don't believe there's any explanation for 25,000 people to show up out here on the edge of nowhere what you drove through was beautiful pasture land but that was forest that was all forest Hmm. And no settler would plant a crop that was larger than he could harvest by himself in one day. Hmm. And so just imagine all of the trees and everything, the forest around here. And people gathered and the glory of God came down and the curate so lovingly said it like this. He said they had what was called <coughs> exercises. I thought for a moment he meant manifestation. 
<laughs> he called them exercises. I believe that some of us understand what I'm saying when I speak about exercises. The next thing out of his mouth was he said they had a low guttural hum mm. that would come from deep within their being. That's exactly how I explained it. A low guttural hum. And I believe that we know what that is. Groanings and travails that come forth out of the spirit-filled believer. And I believe that God wants us now to move in. We only have a limited amount of time, but God can make the world in a moment. Mm. And if our hearts are all expecting at one time, God can meet us in a moment. Yes. And we've asked this wonderful group of people to come and they're going to call us to worship and then we're going to worship like it's 1801. We're going to sing like we haven't been with a congregation to sing in years. And when we take communion today and as we call different ones to come and pray, we're going to believe and we're going to agree with them that God is going to bless America and something significant will happen here. A spark will come and it will be a fire that will become a conflagration that will sweep across this nation from the north to the south to the east and the west and around the world. That's what God has called us here for. Whatever it was that drew you into this building, however you're here, I'm telling you, God will give you an assignment today that will be an assignment for the rest of your life. And you can live in high victory as we move toward the coming of the Lord. Brother, if you will, call us to worship. The shofar in the Old Testament is mentioned over 60 sometimes, and in the New Testament, another 10 or 20 times. And in one verse, Nehemiah 4.20, it says, where the shofar is sounded, draw the people there, and we're here, and I will show up, and I will fight your battle, says the Lord. Now, you know there's a lot of other verses. There's Joe 2, and you could go on, but another one is a watchman on the wall. We're all watchmen on the wall, and we're all priests unto God, so we all have a shofar. It's our mouth to talk. But when we blow the shofar today, we're going to blow the traditional sounds because this is the eve of the eve of Rosh Hashanah. And that's the Jewish New Year, and they blow the shofar 100 times. We're going to blow it about 45 sounds. Tekiah is the first sound, and Tekiah is the call for you to worship Almighty God. He's here. We're not calling him here. We're calling ourselves to him. Worship God. And then the next one is Shevarim, which is the repentance cry for us to repent and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, prevail and wail, as Pastor said, and in representation of our wailing and our crying out today, we have wore sackcloth, is what we have on. It's like a talit, but it's sackcloth, representing they tore their clothes and they wore sackcloth and ashes. So that's what we're doing here. But when we call these calls, we're just going to blow them, and when we blow through three times the the call to worship, the call to repent, and the call to warfare, that means get up, do something for God. We're in the army of Jesus Christ. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Amen? Amen. Amen. And when we blow those sounds, then my hand's going to go up in the air, and then I want you to shout when my hand goes up because we're going to blow the long Takiyah Gedola, which is the blast of healing. When we're raptured, we're all healed. And it's the blast for us now to really realize that we're to be the righteousness of God. He said he's coming for a righteous generation of people. Amen? Amen? So we're not doing this for the fun of it, as I hope you know. We're doing this seriously. Amen. And there is no magic in the horn, but it's the voice of God going into the atmosphere. And when you shout, that's what takes the walls down, the walls of sin, the walls that are tearing our nation apart. Amen? Amen. So don't shout until my hand goes up. And then when I shout and you start shouting, I'm going to hand this mic back to you in a minute. As soon as we are shouting, go ahead and start your worship, will you? Just go right into it. Amen? Okay?
a time of drought happens upon a well that's so deep in the ground that they cannot see the water. He lets out a bellow that's four octaves lower than the human ear can hear. The elephants within 30 miles around can hear that deep bellow. And when they hear that sound, they come running to that place. And when they get there, even there's no water supply, they begin to dance. And as they dance, all of a sudden it breaks up the surface of the earth and water comes gushing out on dry ground. Wow, that's amazing. I felt that just a moment ago. When she
many of you have probably seen this, I saw on the internet an advertisement that's probably the boldest religious advertisement that I have ever seen any church produce. And I'm very proud of what they're standing up for. They're yeah. standing Amen. for life. Yes. Yes. And I want us to pray for the Catholic Church. Yes. Yes. I want you to agree. I'm going to ask Renee, and we understand all of us do, that the Hispanics are the fastest growing ethnic group in America. 35 to 40 percent of that community is Hispanic. And so he's going to pray in Spanish for the Catholic Church that his family have for a long time, you know, experienced the leadership of that in their nation, Morelia, Mexico. He is our Hispanic pastor, and then he's going to pray briefly in English. But I want him to pray in Spanish. You pray in Spanish, pray with him. You pray in tongues, pray with him. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Señor, nuestra hora venimos delante de su presencia, Señor, para darle gracias por su gracia y su misericordia, para pedir el favor de Dios sobre nuestra vida. En esta hora invocamos su nombre, que es glorioso. Invocamos su nombre, que es por sobre todo nombre. Y le pido en esta hora que el fuego de su Espíritu y la presencia de su unción brune en cada alma, en cada fin, en cada corazón. I remember my mother being sick. She was against all odds, diagnosed by a doctor. He told her that she would never walk. And when she heard the gospel, you said the missionary can preach the gospel. Lord, I thank you for the fire of God came upon her. Yes. And against all odds, the Holy Spirit of God touched her life. And she was raised up against all odds. spoken to your prophets and to, and to your holy son Jesus Christ will happen. It will come Lord, to a fulfillment. But I pray Lord in Jesus name, praise up holy men, holy yeah. women of God. Praise God for our compassion and love for your presence Lord. The more that they will not be satisfied with anything last in your presence. With anything last in your spirit. Lord I pray that you bring those holy to uh, into the reality of who you are. Open up our eyes to see who you are. Open the eyes to your people to see who you are on the throne. Yes, that, Lord. Are on the throne Lord. that the people that are surrounding this area threaten the United States of America and that on the throne, that you are on the throne. And I pray in Jesus' name, pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you just allow your spirit to come upon us, even now in Jesus' name, Lord. And we just thank you for what you cannot be doing in our lives and in this nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 How many of you have a family? How many of you do not have a family? The Bible says he sets a solitary in family. We all have a family. The family of God is here. Families in America, parents, children are under attack. Hell is doing everything it can to destroy the future generations, my children and my grandchildren. Your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. And I want us to pray right now. I want the ladies that can pray. I want you ladies to begin to lift up your voices, and I want you to pray. I'm going to ask Tish Webb from Grace Church in the Valley to pray. And I don't want you just to pray. The Bible said the older women would teach the younger women how to well. And I want you to let a well come out of your soul right now. Just a, a cry and a groan. The Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks. Really. The word for thanks there is Eucharist. So since the second century of the church, it's been called Eucharist. 
just a generic name for our community. That's where it came from, we gave thanks. I've often thought, what did he give thanks for? That sense of such a sense, a haunting sense of responsibility in the last year. I'm sure he gave thanks as he looked back, being the word. of Jeffrey Dahmer, the cannibalism of this world, and every rape and every, every murder, we're looking into this cup. He looked into this cup, and that's why he said, let this cup pass from me. Every divorce, every broken heart, every abused and battered child, every lonely, confused person, that's what he looked into that cup and he saw. And he said, let this cup pass from me. And Paul talking about this says it this way. Same night he was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and said, take heed, this is my body. The victory did not come at the cross. The victory came in the garden in that place of intercession. And the victory for this nation is not going to come in voting booths. It's going to come when God's people humble themselves and pray and seek His face and turn from their wicked ways. And then He said, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. And the Bible 
says it like this. This is the cup of the Lord. We just read over that and not get it. I'm telling you, he owned the cup. Amen. That's right. He owns your confusion. He owns your heartbreak. He owns the distress. He owns the discouragement. He owns your fear. He owned the cup. That's why it's called the cup of the Lord. I believe there's healing in this cup. And this bread is symbolic of my body. And we've got to get through the truth. To the truth is the truth. We're examining ourselves more broadly. I'm asking myself hard questions. I know that some would want me to ask myself this question, then pat me on the back and say, you're fine. But I'm examining myself, and I'm asking myself a hard question. Is the life I'm living worth Christ dying for? I thank you for the sacrifice of your perfect, sinless, impeccable self. And I partake this prayer that if I eat it, I'm worthy, I'm guilty of the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't want to go out of here like Judas did with a taste of bread and wine his mouth and betray you. And I partake this now knowing by your stripes we're healed and the life of the flesh is in the blood. I take this knowing that as often as I eat this bread and drink this cup, I show the Lord's death until he comes. We pray now your blessing upon every communicant. In Jesus' name, let's protect the bread.
collectively, corporately, as a church, before we ever cry for business as a nation. And Lord, we cry as the prophet Isaiah, when the heavens come down, come down, come down. Lord, we thank you for moves and spiritual awakenings like King Ridge and Azusa and the Welsh Revival and the Latter Rain and the Charismatic Renewal, the Third Wave, and on and on and on. Thank you for all those. We take all the truths or attempt to take the truths and the, and the anointing from them and carry them to the next. But Lord, we cry for hours now. Now, I was thinking of the passage in John's Gospel of the wedding of Canaan. You know that story. That passage says, he saved the best for last. Well, a, a fair rendering without doing injustice to the passage literally says, he saved the best for now. Because when we think last, we're thinking tomorrow, mañana, down the road. But when we think, he saved the best for it. Now. Now. Let's pray that. He saved the best for it. Now. In 1977, I met Bob Rogers. And we became fast friends. I'd ask Bob to come and address us today. I want him to take a few moments. Everybody can be seated now. I want you to listen intently to my coming prayer. Thank you all to give Pastor Keith a very big hand of appreciation. God sent another revival. 
that lasted for another 40 or 50 years, and then things began to cool down, and then another great revival took place through much fasting, through much prayer. Jonathan Edwards, and, and he came in George Whitfield, and he preached the sermon "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God." When you would see him preach it, many times he would hold on to a, a post in the building. Fact is, I've never seen a picture of him preaching that not holding to a post. That's because he'd been fasting seven, fourteen days before he would preach it. A great revival came. But then in 1799, that was the, first, the Great Awakening, 1799, our country was so backslidden. Harvard University, which had been a Bible school, they could not find one Christian at Harvard University. Dartmouth, which was established as a Bible school to reach Indians, American Indians, it was so corrupt that the students had broken into a Presbyterian church they had stolen, taken the Bible, and burned it publicly. The Lutheran Church and the Episcopal Church were losing so many members, they were talking about merging the two denominations. The Presbyterian Church in New England had not had a, a young person in their church in almost 15 years. And it was during this time that uh, Kentucky became a haven for alcoholics and criminals. Half the women were prostitutes, and 70 percent of the men were just out and out criminals. The fact is, there had not been a jury trial with a judge in five years in the state of Kentucky, and there was a bank robbery that took place in the other 13 colonies every day. If you could escape over the Alleghenies and get to Kentucky, you were a free man. And so these little communities, they would form vigilante groups. That's the only law and order they had. And in the midst of that, there came a Presbyterian minister. His name was James McGreedy. The only claim to fame he had, he was so ugly, he was notably ugly. He was scary ugly. And uh, he came over those mountains, and there had been a prayer revival, the British prayer revival, that had started about 10 years before that. And in that uh, revival, they would take the first Monday of every month, and they would pray until 10 o'clock at night. It had spread over here in America, New England, almost every church, they were praying. They would pray every Monday night until 10 o'clock. Well, McGreedy got over here. He's down in Logan County, about 100 miles from here. And he entered into a covenant about in December. The fact is he made his people sign their, sign uh, a document that they were in a covenant. Not only were they going to pray on Monday nights, the first Monday of each month, but they were going to pray the uh, last thing they did on Saturday night and the first thing they did on Sunday morning they were going to pray for revival. And then they, once a month, they would fast from noon on, uh, on Saturday until the service was over on Sunday afternoon. Well, that took place until that summer. It's about seven months, and revival broke out. He called for a communion service, just like Pastor Keith did, and there were 10,000 people that showed up. It was so powerful that it began to spread. And that's when it came up here to Cane Ridge. And when it hit, hit Cane Ridge, it exploded and affected the whole, the whole uh, uh, North America. So it was here on this place, historically, where the second great awakening took place that shook our nation. 600 Bible schools were started right out of the meeting that took place here. It absolutely was unbelievable. The Baptist church, it uh, tripled in size. The Presbyterian church doubled in size. The Church of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, the Christian church, all this had this birth in the revival that was right here. Now I want to share something and then we're going to pray. I'm going to share about 10 minutes. 
about 500 years before Christ was born, there was a great uh, need of a revival in Israel. The fact is, God had raised up prophets, and the people had turned those prophets, turned from them. So finally God sent the Assyrians trying to get a wake-up call for people to repent. They came uh, down through Damascus. They came from Nineveh, which is a present to Mosul in Iraq. They came on uh, through the past the uh, Sea of Galilee. They destroyed those ancient villages. They burned them. And then they came up and surrounded Jerusalem. And they laid siege on Jerusalem. And then something happened. They were recalled back to Nineveh. When that happened, it was all a wake-up call for them to repent. But did they repent? No. The fact is, their leaders, the king got up, and in Isaiah 9.10, he made this declaration. He said, the bricks have fallen down, but we're going to rebuild them with hewn stones. The sycamores have been plucked up, but we're going to replace them with cedar trees. It was a defiant, arrogant reply to God, we're going to come back stronger, bigger than ever. So finally God said, all right, I've tried everything I can to get your attention. That's when the Assyrians came back and they displaced the captives of Samaria. They put Syrians there. They led the Israelis away as captives. And then it wasn't long after that that Nebuchadnezzar came and he burned the temple. Well, the United States and Israel, we are running a parallel a parallel existence. And many prophesied, including the pilgrims, that we were the new Israel. So America has had two assignments. One is to spread the gospel. To do that, we've had to be wealthy, a wealthy nation. It takes money to spread the gospel. You come here, you prosper, so the gospel can go forth. Secondly, we have an assignment to help birth Israel. To do that, we can't have anybody to bully us around. We have to be the most powerful military might on the face of the earth. But we have backslidden so badly. This is not a Christian nation. And so God, on 9-11, sent a wake-up call to the United States. And in that wake-up call, every person here can remember where you were when the Twin Towers were, were attacked. And what is so amazing is the next day, the parallel between Israel and America became so focused. Now, for that scripture to be a parallel to the United States, it must be declared just like the, leader of, the leaders of Israel declared it. So it has to come from a powerful elected official. It cannot come from the mayor of Lexington, Kentucky. It has to come from a strong leader, and it can't come from Indianapolis or Cincinnati. It has to be made in New York, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. The second highest elected official in this land is the, uh, the, uh, the Speaker of the, uh, uh, not the Speaker of the House, but the, the, of the Senate, the uh, Senate Majority Leader. And Tom Daschle got up the day after 9-11 on September the 12th, and he read that same scripture. He read it as a way of comforting America. He had no clue what he was doing, but he was pronouncing judgment on this nation. He was defiant. I want to share from the scriptures, he said. The bricks have fallen down, but we shall rebuild with huge stone. The sycamores have been plucked up, but we shall plant them with cedars. It was a defiant act of pronouncing judgment upon this nation. Three years later, John Edwards, at that very moment, was lobbying to be vice president, and later he would run for the uh, Democratic uh, position. He got up. He read the same, the same scripture, Isaiah 9.10. On the anniversary, the third anniversary, and once again, he reinforced the judgment that would come. In 1792, 
it was the time of the of the uh, uh, inauguration of George Washington. In those days, uh, Washington, the D.C. was not built, so the inauguration actually took place in New York City. They used the federal building that had been built in 1700, which uh, was the courthouse in New York where he became the capital. It was there, he was inaugurated, he said, let's, uh, let's go down here and let's pray. So they walked four blocks to St. Paul's Chapel, which is spitting distance right across the street from the Twin Towers. It was there, he knelt, he prayed, the leaders of this country prayed, they asked for the favor, mercy of God to fall on America. Then he said this, George Washington declared, if we ever turn our backs on God, may that favor and mercy lift from our land. On 9-11, at the very point where we prayed for God's mercy, it was at that same point that we were attacked. What is so amazing, when uh, all the buildings around it were destroyed, there was only one building that was unscathed, and that was right across the street, St. Paul's Chapel. <coughs> And four blocks away, that federal building, which is a museum today, the foundation was cracked because of the vibration of the earth. Symbolic that our whole nation has been cracked. The foundation of what we believe, the Word of God, it's been broken. And the only thing that was harmed in that, in that yard of St. Paul's Chapel was a tree. Guess what kind of tree? A sycamore tree. The debris fell and destroyed that tree. So the first part of that judgment was the protection that I put around America is going to start coming down. We've been in constant war since that's happened. We've been in Iraq. We've been in Afghanistan. We've had tens of thousands of our young men killed since that moment. But the second part of that judgment was the sycamore will be plucked up and will be planted with the cedar. If you know anything about American history, the Dutch, they're the ones who actually settled Manhattan Island. And it was just the very focal point when ships would come in. That was the place where trade took place. So for protection, they built a wall around Manhattan Island. That's where you get Wall Street. It's a part of that, that protection that was around that island. When the English came in, they took it over, and in 1796, there were 24 uh, merchants that joined together, and they formed what was called the Buttonwood Agreement. It was the New York Stock Exchange. They called it the New York Stock and Exchange. Later, that was shortened just to the New York Stock Exchange, and they formed it in this agreement. No auctioneers could come into it. It was a very defined way of trading. What was so amazing is, do you know what a buttonwood tree is? A buttonwood tree, you look it up, it's the American sycamore. So outside of the Wall, Wall Street uh, today, the New York Stock Exchange, there's a sculpture. I've seen it. And it is the roots of a sycamore tree. And God said the sycamore will be plucked up. Or in other words, America is going to lose its place and the financial leadership of the world. And that's exactly what we are seeing. Exactly what is taking place. It's kind of interesting. The second worst collapse of the New York Stock Exchange took place on 9-11. The worst collapse of the Stock Exchange took place seven years to the day. To the day. And it dropped it dropped 777 points. It uh, lost $700 billion. We lost 7% of the value of America and wiped out seven years of profit all on the same day. Don't you think that's a little strange? Don't you think that might be a little prophetic that took place? I remember years ago, I heard Pat Robinson speak almost 30 years ago. He said the day will come when the economy of America, the economy of the earth, and the nations of the earth will begin to collapse. And out of that will rise 
a group of people, and they will have a solution. The whole solution will be based upon Leviticus chapter 25. It will be a spiritual solution, a supernatural solution, which is basically the year of Jubilee. They are going to begin to proclaim a debt cancellation. That's the only way that this thing will be able to be healed. When you begin to hear that take place, out of that door of those guys of G20, out of the door of those financial leaders, is going to walk the Antichrist. Not only is he going to have a plan, and that plan is this. Let's go to a cashless society. A society that will save us hundreds of billions of dollars a year. There will be no cartel, drug cartel. There will be no illegal trade. We will eliminate that. And we can control it. We will have a worldwide international credit card system. It will be able to be implanted in your thumb and in your forehead. And guess what? You're the people that's on watch when all of this is taking place. You know, I thought to myself, oh God, why couldn't I have been born at some other time? But this is my time. This is your time. We're going to stand before God, every one of us. And we're going to be held accountable for what we did. And if we do what God has told us to do, then that's all God requires. We come here today, every one of us have uh, busy schedules, we come here because we felt like we could make a difference. I come here today because I believe that what's happening here is going to make a difference. We are a part of a, of, of a move of God. It's not just us. Uh, Ann Jimenez is on 40 days from the election is called for a huge rally. That rally is in Philadelphia. We have right now on our own website 250,000 people that have signed up to pass for 40 days until the election. Taking one day a week where we fast collectively, we fast on Monday, it's every Monday until the election. We begin to pray earnestly for God's will to be done. Some of the most powerful warriors you've ever seen are coming out of the Presbyterian churches, out of the Catholic churches. The people that you don't even maybe think are even born again. They're coming and they're standing together in prayer, believing that God can visit our nation once again. And we are going to see a great revival. The Lord spoke to me that that revival you'll know it has arrived because it's not just going to be here in America. It's going to pour your spirit out on the Jewish people. Amen. There's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Ghost like you've never seen before. For that to take place, for that revival to take place in Israel, means Israel will go through great persecution. And in the book of Ezekiel, and it talks about that war of Ezekiel 38-39, which probably will start in the next six months. America is nowhere to be seen. Something's happened to America. Where is America? 61% of America wants to stand with Israel. So it's not something that is uh, going to be uh, where we could not lobby to take place. But I believe there's something is going to happen physically to America where we are unable to defend and help Israel. I don't know what that is. But I know this. God's called us to pray. God's called us to fast. God's called us to join together at this very moment and believe God for this for revival in our nation. Can I hear an amen? amen. amen.